Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Daniel. Uh, I'm an admissions officer here at Georgetown uh, and I'd like to welcome you here to our 2016 admissions open house. So uh, as we get started we'll have uh, several uh, speakers coming up first. So we will ha we'll hear from a few of our deans uh, about our program, student life, academics, and then we'll also have a panel uh, comprised of students, faculty, staff, and alumni. So um, I'd like to first welcome uh, the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar, uh, Dr. Jim Reardon Anderson. Would you like to come up and offer some welcoming remarks? Well, uh, welcome to Georgetown. Um, so I've been at Georgetown for 31 years. I was dean out here for the first round in 2005 to 2009, and then I went back to the main campus in Washington, D.C., and now I've come back again to be dean. And uh, in that period, I think I've seen a lot of higher education at Georgetown, and I will tell you, if you're interested in attending this school, we've got a pretty good faculty, we've got a pretty good staff, we've got a good curriculum, we've got a good student affairs program, we'll do a lot for your sons and daughters or for you personally if you're prospective student. But I will tell you the truth about higher education, and that is that the single most important element in any university is the students. The students set the standard for one another, and I know because I've taught these students for many years, and I can tell you that when you're in a seminar, you see that students are looking at one another saying to themselves, wow, he or she really prepared for this class. I better work harder. So we place an enormous emphasis on the recruitment of outstanding young people to be our students because we well know that they are the linchpin of a high quality university education. And uh, for that reason, we, s we have a very good uh, admission staff. They put together a very good program. You're gonna meet many of them tonight as well as some of the deans. And um, uh, we hope that uh, some of you will join us next fall as incoming freshmen and join what has been a very successful program largely because we've had such outstanding students, some of whom are here, uh, some of our alumni are actually here tonight. And, uh, and they, uh, they, they know because they contributed to it. And I, I remember meeting them, uh, meeting one young man when, I, when he was a student here, and I can testify that he was the kind of student that lit up the classroom for everybody else. So I, I suspect some of you and your sons and daughters are that kind of student as well, and we hope to have them with us next fall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to welcome up uh, Dr. Brendan Hill, our uh, Dean of Students, to offer some remarks on the history of Georgetown and of Georgetown University in Qatar. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I've been with Georgetown University for 26 years, so not quite as long as, as uh, Dean Reardon Anderson, but a fairly long time. <clears throat> I started as a student, um, I teach courses, I was an academic dean on main campus, and now I'm uh, uh, the dean of students here. But I am by training a historian, and so history is very important to me. And as you'll find out, history is a very important part of our curriculum here. So I want to give you a brief, quick history of Georgetown University in four dates. On, that's not there anymore, 1789. That's the year that Georgetown University was founded. Um, 1789 was a very interesting year uh, in world history. 1789 was the year that the Constitution of the United States of America was written and adopted. Uh, 1789 was the year of the French Re Revolution, one of the most significant events in European and world history. <clears throat> These two events really speak to two values that are very important um, to Georgetown University. The French Revolution was about radical change, at least in its very early years. Um, it was about throwing out the old system, throwing out monarchy altogether, uh, people running around calling each other citizen uh, rather than by titles. Uh, uh, they even had something called the bread of equality. No white bread and brown bread. It was all mixed together and you have the bread of equality. So it was a very radical departure from everything that the French had experienced before. The American had a, Americans had a revolution that began in 1976 and really ended um, 
although the warfare ended much earlier, it was settled by the Constitution uh, in 1789. And the Americans chose a very different path than the French. Americans chose to preserve what they thought was good about the old world, but move forward into a new realm. So at its inception, Georgetown University comes between these two forces of change and tradition. And we'll tell you how that kind of really sums things up later. Um, second date is 1865. Um, America has just been through its roughest patch on um, the Civil War that really threatened to tear asunder um, what had been created by the Constitution of 1789. Uh, Georgetown University was positioned just between, or I should say still is positioned, just between the North and the South, right? It was right on the borderline between the Confederacy in the South and the Northern States of the Union. And so it had students, it drew on the student, popu uh, its student population drew both from the North and the South. So they knew that when the Civil War was over, this massive bloody battle that killed uh, so many Americans, was over, they would have to do some reconciliation. And so they really worked to become a place where both Northerners and Southerners felt welcome. Uh, shortly thereafter, they adopted as our, we, we adopted as our colors blue and gray, and you'll see blue and gray um, in many parts of the building. Um, the blue represented the uniforms worn by the Northern Army, the Union Army, and the gray, the uniforms worn by the Army of the Confederacy. So Georgetown University, in its colors, in just the depiction, uh, you know, after that date, 1865, was about reuniting these two very opposing ideas about what the United States should be and providing a welcome space to discuss differences. 1919, Georgetown University has been around at, by 1919 for over 100 years. And Georgetown University always enjoyed the unique advantage of being in a dynamic world capital. Washington, D.C. Um, 1919 was a very important year for America, 1918, 1919. Uh, America participated after a century of what some would erroneously call isolationism, but certainly an attention to the new world, the Western Hemisphere, and not the, the old world. I'm just looking at the woman who wrote the book that defies what I'm just saying, but let's just imagine for a minute uh, that America was isolationist in the 19th century. Its participation in World War I brought it onto the world stage in a very big, overt way. Um, and uh, it is uh, it, the, the founder of the School of Foreign Service, Edmund Walsh, was a Jesuit at Georgetown University what was then called the College of Georgetown University, Traditional Liberal Arts and Science College. He was in the United States delegation to the peace treaty um, uh, that settled World War I. Um, and what he noticed is that the American diplomats didn't have much training. The American diplomats didn't seem to understand the world as well as the French and the German and the British and all of the other uh, nations that were represented there. So he thought, that it would be a good idea to open up within Georgetown University an undergraduate school devoted to training people, training American people for service to the world now that America had entered into the world stage. And he founded in 1919 the School of Foreign Service, which bears his name. It's the official title of the School of Foreign Service is the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. So another very important date, and what it, that date did was signal America's um, commitment to train its youth to, for global service in all of its many manifestations, not just diplomacy, but global trade, global NGOs, um, human rights, a number of different facets. Since its beginning, the School of Foreign Service has done that. The final date that I want to talk about is 2005, because in 2005, Georgetown University opened up its first and to this date only uh, branch campus here in Qatar. And that's where you see all of these other dates converging, right? So when you look at everything that I've mentioned about these other dates, 1789, America poises, itself, and Georgetown University poises itself to accept tradition, but to seek modern ways to express tradition. So it values, unlike the French Revolution, it values both tradition and modernity, right? Um, you see 
the reconciliation between two opposing sides that many felt that couldn't felt couldn't be reconciled uh, from 1865. You see America poised to train its uh, people through Georgetown University School of Foreign Service for service to the world, for engagement with the rest of the world. And why do these all culminate in 2005? Because that's exactly where Qatar is. Qatar is a nation that values tradition, but it's a nation that also seeks modernity. So trying to strike that balance between tradition and modernity. Qatar is a nation uh, where people of different faiths and people of different backgrounds come together and try to work through your problems, uh, through their problems, try to resolve things. Qatar has positioned itself in the world as a peacemaker um, and bringing different sides together. Uh, and finally, Qatar has successfully entered uh, the global arena and is ready to train its youth to take on the global challenges. Um, and that, in a nutshell, uh, was the thing that drew me out here so much. Because as a historian, I value the legacy of Georgetown University. As a historian who's been with Georgetown for 26 years, I value the legacy that Georgetown has. And for me, this move, when I came out 10 years ago, really made sense, and it still does to this day. And I hope to welcome you and your sons and daughters uh, to be a part of this tradition that's over 200 years old. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Hill. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Dr. Jim McGregor, uh, our Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at Georgetown University in Qatar School of Foreign Service. Uh, and he will speak about uh, our programs and about what we have to offer academically here at Georgetown. So welcome, Jim. All right, thank you, David. Welcome, everyone, this evening. It's, it's good to see all of you here. So I have, uh, I have been charged with no mean feat this evening, which is namely to talk to you about our academic program in about 10 minutes. Now, given that the academic program is pretty much what I do for a living and it is my life, that is uh, going to be a bit challenging, but I will, I will do my best to sort of stick on script and give you what I think are the, the basic facts you need to know to, to hopefully make a decision to, to come here, right? You're considering a whole lot of other universities potentially. You're considering Georgetown and Cutter, so that's why you're sitting here tonight. And so between what Dean Reardon and Anderson has told you and what Dean Hill has now told you, I'm hoping I can sort of help to seal the deal with my, my quick overview of what it is we do in academics here. So we are Georgetown University and Cutter, but, but so sitting underneath that very broad umbrella, we are the School of Foreign Service in Cutter, and, and Dean Hill has just given you a very eloquent history of that school. And as a School of Foreign Service in Qatar, we offer one academic program, one degree, and that is the Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service degree. It is the same degree that is offered by the School of Foreign Service in Washington, D.C., in every respect. Uh, the curriculum is the same, uh, and at the end of the day, if you come here and you graduate, the diploma that you get is the same. So it is the exact same Bachelor of Science, Foreign, Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service, or BSFS degree, as off, is, is offered on the main campus in Washington, D.C. Now, as, as Dean Hill pointed out, the school itself was founded as a training ground for diplomats. And, and in its earliest decades, that's primarily what it was intended to do. And it did a very good job at that. It essentially trained up the U.S. Foreign Service, brought it almost uh, into creation, into existence, excuse me. It created it. But as we, as we now move towards the year 2019, as we move towards the 100th anniversary of the founding of the School of Foreign Service, uh, the concept of foreign service in the name of our school and in the name of our degree has been broadened significantly. So while we are still very much a, a training ground for future and potential diplomats, while some of our graduates will go on to work in the diplomatic service of, of, their, of their home countries, that is not all our degree does. Our degree is intended, in fact, to train students to engage in, a, in, in any number of careers and, and to follow any, any path, number of paths in life that will allow them to be effective actors, to, be, to allow them to be effective players on the global stage, on the world stage. In fact, the, the key word in the name of our degree is service, right? We're trying to prepare students for lives of service to their fellow men and women in the world in whatever capacity our graduates ultimately choose to serve. It's up to them, but that's what we're trying to achieve. So 
with that big wrap up, or wind up, excuse me, I haven't quite gotten to wrapping up yet if you hadn't noticed, um, <laughs> with that wind up, um, let, me, let me try to just tell you in a nutshell what it is our curriculum looks like. What is it about our curriculum, our academic program, that prepares our students to go out and to engage in a life of service in the world? Our curriculum has three very broad components. We have our core curriculum, we have our major curriculum, and then we have a foreign language proficiency requirement. The core curriculum, as its name suggests, sits at the very heart of the degree. Every student who pursues the BSFS degree has to complete our core curriculum. And from my perspective, the one thing that binds together all the courses in our core curriculum is an emphasis on, on the individual student, an emphasis on how that individual student can effectively interact with other individuals, not only in their classroom, but in the wider world beyond that classroom, beyond this university. The entire core curriculum, from my perspective, is geared towards developing students to be effective communicators, to be effective listeners, and to be able to effectively engage with other people regardless of those people's backgrounds or points of view or politics or religion. So our core curriculum requires students to take courses in history, for example. History, as many of you will realize, is very formative in how we identify ourselves and how we identify our countries and our place in the world. So by requiring students to take a healthy dose of history, we provide them with the analytical skills to understand the past and to understand how it influences the lives uh, of people who have very different histories. We require students to take courses in theology. Right? Religion, a, a, a fundamental, fundamental factor in, in how human beings identify themselves and understand their place in the world and vis-a-vis -vis one another. By requiring students to take theology, we hope to introduce them to the, the myriad belief systems that people around the world can hold and do hold, and in so doing, once they complete those classes, to effectively be able to engage with um, other people who hold a very different religious beliefs from the ones that they may hold. We require students to take a healthy dose of uh, economics. Economics, a, uh, a huge factor in, in the world in which we live, a huge factor in the decisions that, that individuals and corporations and states and nations make on a daily basis, uh, a significant factor in how it is we engage with one another, talk to one another, and make decisions. So requiring students to have a background in economics, crucial to enabling them to be effective communicators on the world stage. And then by way of one final example, we require students to take uh, several courses in uh, writing. And so the idea is if you're going to be an effective communicator, we want you to be an effective communicator verbally, but we also want you to be a, an effective communicator using the written word so that you can then again be effective out there in the world as you go out there and find the way in which you hope to serve it. So that's the, the core curriculum in a nutshell. Then there is the major curriculum. Uh, students spend roughly the first two years doing the core curriculum. They then pursue one of our four major courses of study. And those are culture and politics, international economics, international history, and international politics. And all of those majors sit very neatly on top of the core. The idea of the core curriculum is that students are exposed to a wide variety of topics and subjects to a, a wide variety of our faculty members, and as a result of completing that core, they decide which one of these three, or excuse me, four major courses of study that they ultimately want to pursue. So as I said, the core curriculum contains a history requirement. For students who excel at that requirement in the core, they can choose to pursue a major in international history. Uh, we have two required uh, political science courses in our core. For students who really find that fascinating, they can move on to pursue the international politics major. Economics is in the core, international economics major. The odd one is culture and politics, right? Economics, politi uh, polit politics, history, lots of universities have, ma have majors in those things. Culture and politics is actually unique to the School of Foreign Service. And uh, this is a major for students who find politics interesting and who find history interesting and potentially economics interesting. But they, they want to pursue a major that allows them to examine the interactions between those disciplines and the other disciplines of the core in a much broader way to truly understand the intersection of politics broadly defined and culture broadly defined and how those two things influence each other. So those are our four major courses of study. And if the core curriculum takes up the first two years, the majors tend to take up 
the second two years, the program in and of itself designed for students to complete in four years of study, 12 semesters. Um, and then finally, the third component of our curriculum is the foreign language proficiency. All graduates of the School of Foreign Service are required to demonstrate proficiency in a, uh, one foreign language other than English. Uh, in the service of that requirement, we teach two languages here at the School of Foreign Service. In Qatar, we teach Arabic and we teach French. Our Arabic program is unique because it offers students two tracks to pursue the study of the Arabic language. Uh, one track is intended for, for students of Arabic who have had no previous exposure to the language, either linguistically or any exposure to the cultural environment in which that language would be used. So it's essentially a course of study for people coming to the language as, as, as pure, almost foreign language learners. And then we have another course of study in Arabic that is designed specifically for heritage language learners, for students who have already have a background in the Arabic language, who come from a, a cultural, social, familial setting in which Arabic is used, whether or not they speak it fluently or not. But the idea is that students who come already with that previous understanding of Arabic and its cultural milieu have a different track through the Arabic uh, sequence here at, the, at Georgetown University in Qatar. And we are, we are unique in this. There are not a lot of universities that offer this dual track through the Arabic language sequence. So those are the two languages we teach. However, students can pursue language proficiency in any language that they desire. Our student body is incredibly diverse. They come to us with a whole host of, of, of native languages, ranging from Urdu to Malayalam to Spanish, and I can keep rattling these off all night. And so students can uh, pursue proficiency in any one of those. And the, the purpose of the requirement, I think, is fairly straightforward. Again, if we're trying to prepare graduates to go in the world and to engage with others, to engage with people who are different than them, the ability to function not only in English, which is a universally used language for the most part, but also to function in at least one other language is vitally important. So that is the short version, I promise you. <laughs> I'm looking down at my colleagues from admissions who are probably wanting me to wrap this up. Um, but I will be out here in the atrium along with my colleague, Dean Heather Kirst, and we can answer any questions you may have about the academic program out there. So thank you very much for your time, and thank you again for joining us. I'd now like to welcome our Director of Admissions, Joseph Hernandez, who will come and speak to us uh, about our application and admissions at Georgetown University in Qatar. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to recognize a, a small group, uh, about 15 uh, people who are joining us from all around the world uh, via our live stream. So last year, we, uh, we hosted our live stream of this event for the first time. Uh, we have a small group of folks that have joined us um, tonight as well, so I just wanted to, to welcome them all as well. And I hope uh, that one of them is my mom, so hi, Ma. Um, I don't know if she's watching, but uh, we did talk about it. Um, so just let me uh, begin. Again, my name is Joe Hernandez. I'm the Director of Admission here at Georgetown, and, and it really is a pleasure to, to welcome you here. Um, I want to thank you for, for joining us this evening uh, for the first open house of the year. Um, each year we do this and we try to put another event that focuses on student life um, in addition to the academic life of the university. Uh, and that normally happens uh, later in the year. Uh, so if you haven't heard about it, it will be reaching out to you soon. I want to thank you for your interest in Georgetown uh, and for taking the time to meet those of us here who work to create the Georgetown experience in Doha and to ensure that we deliver the program that Dean McGregor has so ably described to the high standard established in Washington, DC. And it's, it's interesting, and, and perhaps my, my boss would not like to hear this, but I don't know why you are here tonight. Uh, at least not until we get to talking to you, to get to know you, uh, to get to see you as an applicant and as a potential student. I don't know up front what brought you here. Uh, and I was going to make a joke about last week's election and perhaps your prospects of going to the States. Perhaps you don't want to go to the States anymore. I'm not sure. Uh, but I figured I wouldn't uh, quite make that joke and I won't be too, too political. Uh, but what I hope is that you've seen something in Georgetown that has captured your imagination. Georgetown's history as a great university as described by Dean Hill, or perhaps it's the majors as described by Dean McGregor, 
the certificate programs, perhaps it's our students, the, the dynamic community that we try to create here in Doha. Or perhaps it's a network of alumni of 30,000 School of Foreign Service alumni in over 120 countries that serve all of our students uh, that has attracted you here tonight. I don't know exactly what it is about Georgetown that brought you here, but that's what we want to learn uh, through your application and through our interactions with you tonight. Whatever the reason, tonight my role is to, if I can get this right, talk about admissions, all right? But before I talk about the requirements of our application, what I need you to, what I would like to do is to put this institution in perspective. I'm proud to work for Georgetown. I'm proud to represent Georgetown, uh, as Dean Hill mentioned, with over 225 years of history of academic excellence and service. As Dean Hill mentioned, the School of Foreign Service was founded in 1919, and at the time, Father Walsh, our founding dean, recognized the need to improve education and diplomacy in the United States. So he nurtured a vision of a school that would include all major forms of international representation, official and unofficial, governmental and private sector, commercial, financial, consular, or diplomatic. Since then, we've been educating women and men on global issues and preparing them for lives of service and leadership in the international arena. Importantly, the quality of the education that we provide has always been of the highest caliber. Today, the School of Foreign Service comprises approximately 1,650 students, just under 250 you'll find here in Doha. Amongst our alumni, we count heads of state and government, leaders in international law, business and media, committed diplomats and humanitarians, and the, some of the brightest minds in research and the academic fields. So from an admissions perspective, these are the standards that motivate us and the precedents that encourage us to identify, to recruit, and to enroll the best students we can possibly recruit. Students and parents often ask, what are the secrets to get, of getting into Georgetown? Uh, in fact, there's a young woman in the room tonight. She knows who she is. I was speaking with her last week at Discover Education City, and she asked me just that question. What can I do? What is a secret? What, what can I know about the application process that will help me get into Georgetown? And the, the answer to that question is there are no secrets. In fact, Georgetown publishes the formula for admission on our walls. From the glass walls along our hallways to the flags that line our corridors, the secret to admission is in our values. We're looking for students who excel academically, students that take pride in their schoolwork, that seek an education that helps them uncover truth and discover meaning. So as it applies to our applicants, we want to recruit students that are capable of succeeding across all areas of our curriculum from economics, to history, to English, to politics, across the board. Academics here are a given, but what we are interested in is contributing to your overall development as a student and as a person. From interactions with faculty and staff to student clubs, sports, activities, you'll always be learning at Georgetown. So we're also looking for students that demonstrate a willingness and an ability to take advantage of all of the learning opportunities available here at Georgetown. As it applies to you as applicants, help us see through your personal statement and extracurricular activities, through the references of your counselors and teachers, that you are that kind of student and that kind of person that will be willing and able to take advantage of all the learning opportunities here. And in case you missed it in what uh, Dean Reardon Anderson said, and Dean Hill said, and Dean McGregor uh, alluded to, we are about service. Education is a valuable gift, and a gift that increases in value when it is applied in the service of others. And this is a big one for us. Here at GUQ, we want our students to be engaged in work that helps others, that protects the most vulnerable, and that considers the communities in which we live. 
whether it's service to your government, through the private sector, or in your daily lives, at the point of application, we're looking for students that demonstrate a history and a future of service. There are just about 240 students here at Georgetown and over 40 faculty members. Countless others that are directly involved in caring for student well-being and success. And so when we say cura personalis, Latin for care for the person or care of the person, uh, we are not just paying lip service to, to some old adage or to, uh, to a saying with, with empty meaning. Uh, we are making a commitment, a true commitment, to supporting students as individuals. All right? So what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for me in admissions? Uh, we review applications one at a time. Uh, and as you'll come to understand after being admitted to or enrolling at Georgetown, we, we get to know you in this process. And some of our students uh, perhaps are a bit weirded out that we remember what you say, that we actually read your personal statements and that we remember what you have sh said, what you have shared in your personal statements. Uh, and that's, that's a commitment to you as an individual student. And when it comes to offering a degree in international affairs, it's helpful and uh, some might say it's actually necessary, it's imperative, it's a must that our students reflect the reality of the, of the world in which they'll soon work. So we seek to recruit students from all over the world, from all corners of the globe, from different faith traditions, from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different educational systems, and the rest. As it applies to admission, here at GU, those students that demonstrate that they share these values, that they're ready to work in a global, diverse, interconnected world, will be sure to get our attention. So our values guide admissions. There are more values, and each and every one of them, again, they are online, they are on the glass windows when you walk down, they are on flags in the corridors when you take a tour. Those guide admission. So if you get to know those and get to ask yourself questions regarding those values, you will find the answer to what it takes to be admitted at Georgetown. So before uh, outlining the nuts and bolts of the process, I also wanted to add that the process is a holistic one here at Georgetown. We take a full view of your application. We consider all of your strengths and abilities when we review your application. We consider your grades, the rigor of the curriculum in which you're engaged, the courses in which you chose to take. Uh, we look at language ability. We look at your teacher and your counselor references. We look at what you say about yourself. And what we're trying to do is predict the, the probability of your success in this program, for this program. So it is a holistic uh, process. It is not a process in which you can say any one factor will win you admission to Georgetown. And that's something that, that we tell students and we'll remind students throughout the entire process that it is a holistic one. So as you think about your own application to Georgetown, any, or anywhere else for that matter, uh, I'd like you to ask yourself two questions. The first question is, where will they find my strengths? Right? And you have to be honest with yourself about your strengths and your abilities and how those are being reflected at the point of application. Right? So the second question I'd like you to ask yourself is, how do my strengths align with the values of the university? So those, my friends, are the secrets, they're open secrets to admission at Georgetown. Uh, and I encourage you to really look at those values and look at what we, what we say about ourselves and place yourselves in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that way. Think of yourselves in that way. Uh, so next, um, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes on the actual application and on the process, um, for which some of you, to some of you, should be familiar, because we've, we've had a few conversations already. Uh, but for others, it may be a bit of a new process. We have a traditional American admissions uh, process here at Georgetown. First, the application form. The application form is essentially a biographic data form. Uh, and we ask your name, your father's name, your mother's name, what school do you go to? Um, we ask for your counselor's name and their email address and your teacher's name and their email address. All information, we also ask if you've ever been convicted of a crime and things that we're required to ask. Um, 
this form should be relatively easy to fill out and to submit. And we ask you to do that by February 1st. Uh, so you do not require, we, we do not require that you have your supporting documents when you submit your application. And so you might ask, what are, your, what are our supporting documents? Everything else. So from the personal statement to your test scores, to your language scores, uh, those are uh, to your uh, uh, teacher references and your transcripts, all of those we call supporting documents to that initial application. Uh, so again, the application can be submitted before these supporting documents. In the personal statement, what we, uh, and by the way, as I go into the personal statement, I'll say, if you mark your calendars on November 30th at 4 p.m., uh, we'll have a team of people that will be delivering a workshop on writing the best possible essay you can write for Georgetown. So again, that's November 30th. We'll have a, a, the second workshop of the season on essay on your personal statement. And many students ask, some, ask themselves, what should I write about? Uh, pretty much whatever you like. Our prompt is, uh, is quite um, open-ended. And so we ask, tell, we ask you to tell the committee a little bit about yourself, right? Why are you applying to Georgetown University? What motivates you? Why would you like to study international history or international economics or international politics or culture and politics? Tell us in your, through your personal statement, what would you contribute to this community? What would you gain to, from this community? What are your accomplishments? What activities have you been engaged in? How have you persevered in the face of unusual or difficult circumstances? All of these things you can write about, you can select it. How you write it, your style, your tone, is all up to you. The worst thing for us as admissions officers is to have uh, hundreds of essays that all look the same. So we, we really encourage you to find your voice and to find your story and share that with the admissions committee, remembering the purpose of the document, and that is you are seeking admission to Georgetown University, not to uh, sometimes, you know, some students copy and paste and forget to change from one university name to the other. So we are not George Washington University. We are not George Mason University. We are not Northwestern University or CMU. We are Georgetown University. So really, you really want to tailor your message to this program, this university. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for you, in your own words, to help us see the individual that I described that we're looking for when I was talking about our values. All right. Transcripts and grade reports. Remember what I said about academic excellence in the beginning? This is where we see it. All right. This is where you get to prove it, that you can do the work. So we require years 10, 11, and 12, and anything beyond year 10, 11, and 12. Uh, and the easiest way for you, and this is work for your counselor, this is not work for the student. All right, so the easiest way for you to request this is to have your counselor upload the transcripts through the online application system. When you enter your counselor's name and email address in the application, they will receive a notification, and in that way they can upload the reference and they can upload your transcripts as well. We will, for many schools, counselors don't use the system. We will also accept them in original format or in sealed envelopes uh, or directly from your counselor uh, from an official email address as well. So the counselor and teacher references also online, when you enter their names and emails, they get a request, they can submit this form uh, online. We discourage students from submitting hard copy um, forms for the teacher and counselor reference. But again, some teachers are, are still uh, wanting and preferring the paper and we're happy to accept that. Uh, as long as we have uh, pre-approved that. Uh, so we, we work, try to work with our counselors and our teachers um, to encourage them to use the online system. SAT or ACT. So this is the bane of uh, many students' existence at the moment. Uh, as much as I say it, nobody believes me. SAT and ACT are not the most important part of your application. They are an important part of your application, but they are not the most important part of your application. The most important part of your application is what you do over three years or four years or, or more, and not what you do on a Saturday morning over three or four hours, okay? These are, in, these are important indicators for us. 
we understand their value to admissions, but we want to let you know that it is not the most important part of your application. Uh, TOEFL, and so these are the, the codes for the, the SAT and ACT. We do require that you request that those scores be sent directly from the test administrator to Georgetown. We receive all of these scores electronically, normally within two or three days of you requesting it, we're going to get it electronically, all right? Uh, and then TOEFL or IELTS is required for all students whose native language is not English. Right. There are some instances in which we will waive this requirement, uh, and I encourage you to, to speak to the admissions staff after if you think that perhaps you can, um, uh, you will be eligible for a waiver. We do not waive based on the uh, curriculum that you're engaged in, and we cannot uh, waive based on nationality, uh, because many students hold nationalities for countries in which they've never lived and languages that are spoken, for which those students don't speak. The last opportunity for students to apply for this year for uh, the SAT, I believe it's December 31st for the registration for the SAT, for the June 21st uh, test. And the Cutter Foundation is offering the ACT residual as late as January 28th. They may have another one beyond January 28th, but those scores don't typically arrive in time for our admissions process. So we're encouraging you to test no later than, than January. All right, again, February 1st for the application form. Uh, I'll say one more thing about this, uh, and that is we are trying to encourage you to do your applications, to submit your applications early. So if this form is submitted by December 31st, we will automatically waive uh, the, the application fee. Uh, and we have, we have no interest in taking uh, application fees. We're required to, to have an application fee. Um, so we will only charge that fee in the last month of, of application, and that's the month of January. So if you submit that form in January, you're out 250 reals. If you submit it December 31st, you save yourself 250 uh, reals and take your friends to the movies. Um, again, all supporting documents are due by March 1st. Um, and you do not need to have these supporting documents in hand for us to waive the fee by December 31st. So again, you do not need to have these to submit the form. Uh, one more thing on the SAT. We encourage students to do the SAT with writing. Uh, the writing has just recently been made optional. So students are seeing the optional and thinking, I don't have to do the SAT with writing. Uh, one benefit to the SAT with writing is that we will waive the controlled writing exercise for you if you do the SAT with writing and we receive that writing sample. Unfortunately, we do not receive the writing sample for the ACT with writing, uh, but we will receive it for the SAT with writing and we will waive the controlled writing exercise. Um, what's the controlled writing exercise? Uh, it is a one hour long session in which we ask you an open-ended question and we expect you to free write for one hour, similar to what a faculty member might require of you as, uh, as, a, as a student here in a classroom. So many students have uh, loads of help with their applications and we encourage you to have others look at your, your essays or your personal statement and everything else, uh, but we really wanna know how you write as an individual and so we want, you, we want to see what your writing is like in a controlled environment without the help of others. We used to have a second essay, uh, so we have, because of the load of the application, we have eliminated the second essay, uh, but we've kept the, the controlled writing. The next thing is interviews. Uh, people get nervous about the interview. Um, interviews at Georgetown are by invitation only, right? And everybody thinks, if I didn't get an invitation, that's bad news. Getting an invitation for an interview is not an indication of admissibility. Uh, we have to do over 200 interviews in a matter of a couple of weeks uh, because we do them after we have a certain amount of information. So we are unable to interview every single applicant. But we will begin contacting students normally in the month of January for interviews and interviews will go through straight through March, okay? And finally, um, win or lose, good news or bad news, positive or negative, we endeavor to get decisions out by April 15th. Uh, and we always try to do that to get our decisions out earlier 
uh, but decisions will be, will be released no later than April 15th uh, each year. I really want to encourage you to check out our website, to look at our questions, to really engage and digest all the information that's out there. Uh, and then now I'm going to invite all of our panelists to come up. I want to thank you, the, thank the panelists for coming tonight. Uh, I want to really encourage you to ask them questions about their experience. Uh, we have a faculty member, we have an alum, um, we have a student development uh, representative. Ask them about their experiences here at Georgetown. Uh, the admission staff after this session will be in the lobby of the atrium and will be there to answer any questions you have regarding the admissions process, regarding anything I've talked about today. So I just want to finally just thank you for coming tonight uh, and again invite you to uh, enjoy the evening, enjoy the reception after. Uh, again, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you Joe, for the speech. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Miriam. Uh, I'm an admissions officer. I just figured I'd introduce myself. I've met a lot of you uh, previously. If you have any questions about um, what Joe had mentioned in terms of the essay writing workshop or any help with the application, I'll be here outside. Uh, now we have the panel, so let me introduce Ms. Jehan Samara. She is the Associate Director of Admissions. Thank you, Maryam. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Georgetown's uh, Open House. So after you've heard from our uh, wonderful speakers about Georgetown history, the academic program, and also how to apply to the university, we figured it would be very helpful also to, to hear from other members of our community, from our faculty who work really hard to ensure academic and teaching excellence, from our student life staff who are working to support students and ensure they have an equally positive experience outside of the classroom, and definitely from our best ambassadors, our students and graduates, who can share their experience as well. And we trust it's a positive experience. Uh, and so without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first panelist. Let me introduce Dr. Karine Wal Walther. Uh, Dr. Walther uh, is a graduate of uh, Columbia University. She has a PhD from Columbia University. She's an associate professor here at Georgetown, Qatar. She teaches history. And she has recently published her book, uh, The Sacred Interest, The United States and the Islamic World, 1821 to 1921. Uh, uh, professor Walther. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the things that um, Joe Hernandez said about, um, about admissions and about you is that he's, you know, we're all interested in what captures your imagination and why you are interested in coming to Georgetown. But I thought that um, I would explain a little bit what has captured my uh, imagination in the last eight years and why I'm still so excited to go into the classroom every day. Um, and let me begin by, by saying it has a lot to do with what I study. Um, I went to Columbia in the early 2000s, and it was a moment where, in history, globalization was really starting to reshape the way that historians thought. And this was particularly true for historians of the United States. Um, many historians of the United States have often been accused of being very parochial, of just understanding the United States on its own terms, what we might call um, American exceptionalism, or just really understanding the United States not in relationship to the world. And I think what was really interesting about the 1980s and 1990s and 2000s is that historians of the United States started to really understand that we could only understand American history by understanding its place within world history. So that's where I um, was, was doing my research. I was looking at uh, the history of US foreign relations um, and particularly with the Islamic world. And um, one of the things that has, I have found so exciting about being at Georgetown is that that kind of um, research has really um, been enhanced by my teaching here. And this is why I would say that Georgetown, Qatar is like no place else in the world. I have experienced teaching at um, two other policy schools in the United States. Nowhere else do I get the kinds of teaching experience that I get here. And I say this because um, I benefit from this as a teacher, but I know that my students um, benefit from this most of all. What do I mean by this? When I'm teaching American history, um, to people um, in, a, in a classroom of 10 to 15 students. First of all, a very, very small classroom. If you go anywhere in the United States, it's very, very rare that you're going to get that kind of experience. Here, you're going to have very small classrooms, and you're going to have students from everywhere in the world. 
And nowhere else do you get to understand history in a globalized way as you do here. And I think that's been one of the things that's been most exciting for me as a teacher, because I learn from my students every day. Um, it's one thing to, te to teach about the United States' relationship with the Middle East in the United States. It's a very different thing to teach the United States' relationship to people who are from the Middle East and have been um, often, how do I put this, the victims of US uh, actions, sometimes benefits, I would say. Um, you will get more once you get into my classroom, but I'll just, I'll just stay there for, for now. Um, but to be honest, my experience as a teacher here has been unparalleled in any other university in the United States. And I, I would say that's, that's Columbia, and I've also had the privilege of teaching at Harvard. And this place is so much better um, as an educational experience for the students. It's really, really unparalleled. Um, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about what it really means to be in the classroom um, at Georgetown, Qatar. Um, any questions you have about the history cur curriculum or any other and, you know, questions that you might have in general about what it means to be a student here um, at Georgetown. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Walther. Our next, our next panelist is Ms. Jackie Snell. Uh, Ms. Snell is a graduate of Georgetown uh, main campus in Washington, D.C. She's been here in Qatar, uh, Georgetown for almost five years. And uh, she is currently the uh, educational enrichment manager. And she oversees our educational outreach programs to high schools, and all of them, including uh, Planet Georgetown, uh, Georgetown Pre-College Summer Program, and the Model United Nations Program. Um, so, Ms. Snell. Thank you, Jahan. Hello, everyone. It's good to see some familiar faces and some new faces. So it's just, uh, Jahan said, I have a unique perspective in that I was a student in our main campus in Washington, DC, and graduated from our campus there, and then moved out to Qatar to work here at our campus in Doha. And so I've been able to see both campuses and actually be so pleasantly surprised by our campus out here. And after working here in Qatar, I have to say that Georgetown's campus provides so many opportunities for our students that are just not available on our main campus in Washington, D.C. And so I want to talk a little bit about the work that my office does in order to ensure a rewarding and, as Joe said, holistic experience for current Georgetown students, but also talk to you a little bit about ways that you can interact with Georgetown before you even apply or before you even matriculate as a student so you can really get to know what the Georgetown ethos and community is really like. So first I want to start with some of the programs that our university offers for high school students like you to not only develop personally and academically but also get a little bit of an insight about what it's like to be a Georgetown student. So the sub-department that I run focuses on enrichment programs, outreach programs for high school students just like you. And we have three main initiatives. We have Planet Georgetown, which is a once a month workshop series here at our Georgetown campus in our building here in Education City. And it's free and open up to students of all high school ages. So freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, usually about 14 to 18 or 19, depending on how old you are. And in those workshops, you get the opportunity to develop a certain skill or skill set that not only will help you in your current academic setting in high school, but will also help prepare you for success in university. So we focus on anything from time management and goal setting to current event analysis, where you get to start analyzing things and thinking critically, thinking like a Georgetown student, voicing your opinion, debating. We recently had a college application skills workshop a few weeks ago, and then we also have a leadership development workshop coming up in January. And so these are really interesting workshops for, to enable you to grow personally if you're looking for more activities or, way to grow, or ways to grow personally outside of your high school. But every one of those uh, activities also has current Georgetown students and staff at them. And so that'll enable you to get to know current Georgetown students, to develop relationships with them, to ask them questions. What's it like to be a Georgetown student? For some of you, you might not know anyone that's a Georgetown student. You might not know anyone that's in Education City. So if you want to get involved in those programs, you'll get to be able to make relationships and get to know Georgetown students and ask them some of those questions uh, once you develop a relationship. 
We also have our Model United Nations program. It's currently the longest running Model United Nations conference in Qatar. This is our 12th year. And we welcome around 400 international and local school students from all over the world to the conference every year. And so many of your schools probably have already signed up. And this is a great way to practice diplomacy in action, debate, and you'll also get to meet with students from all over Qatar, but also all over the world. And also our Georgetown students run and chair all the committees. So this is another opportunity for you get to get to know Georgetown students. So you can ask maybe some of those questions if you're interested in Georgetown life. And lastly, we have GPS, which is our Georgetown Pre-College Summer Program. It's a three week intensive program in the summer, which is really focused on your last two years of high school, preparing you for applying to university and building some of those skills so you'll be a strong applicant. So those are three of the summer programs that we have. So if you're interested, if you've thought, oh, you know, the things that the deans and Joe have said are kind of interesting, but I don't know much about Georgetown. We have many opportunities for you before you even apply to get to know Georgetown better. And I know personally, when I was a high school student, I didn't have that opportunity. So that's something that our campus here in Qatar has that's very unique, that you can really get to know Georgetown and its students and its culture before you even apply through the many programs that we do have. Now transferring a little bit to student development, the, pro, uh, the department that I work in. Once you're a Georgetown student, we really want to make sure that you're growing in the classroom, as Kareen said, through discussions with your peers in our state-of-the-art facilities and our amazing faculty that we do have here, but also making sure you're growing outside the classroom, engaging in clubs, participating in one of our two international travel programs. We have our Zones of Conflict, Zones of Peace program, which is a conflict studies program where we study a historical conflict in detail and then we actually go to the country or countries and study it on the ground. Um, Dr. Kareen Walther actually participated with us a few years ago. And um, so that's an interesting program that we have for students, as well as our community engagement program, which is where you study a certain theme or topic such as disaster management or international education development and then you go to an actual country and then you participate in a build with Habitat for Humanity as well as meet with key players on the ground. So one thing I have to say as I know I wrap up but Georgetown Cutter has so many opportunities for such a small student body. Comparing it to my experience on main campus on main campus, there are so many more students that it's, there aren't as many opportunities. But here, because we're such a small student body and there are so many opportunities for each individual student, I think it's an amazing opportunity for the students that join our student body. Thank you, Jackie. Our next panelist is Tekle. Our next panelist is Tekle Gagocuzzi. I hope I said that right, sorry. Uh, Tekle is a current student at Georgetown. She's a senior. She's actually an international student that joined, that joined Georgetown from Georgia. She's currently majoring in culture and politics and she will be graduating in May 2017. Thank you, good evening everyone. I was listening to the application requirements and um, the presentation and I had such a flashback of my senior year high school and I was thinking, oh my God, people are going through this right now. I can imagine the frustrations. I know how tough this is, how stressful to choose and to go through all this process. But, 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 once you're in, that comes a little different environment hits you. Everything, all this gone, forgotten, and you completely concentrate on the environment you're in. And that's what I want to talk about, the environment, both academically and student life-wise. Uh, Dean McGregor was actually my pro seminar professor the first semester. And I was remembering myself, like, how confused I was and the group of people with me. Seeing as, like, the some, like, few, few first weeks when you just, like, don't know how to um, operate with the system or how to interact with people. It was, imagine, a completely different world for me, especially. And... Um, then, then I was thinking of that and how some of the people who are sitting next to me in that class are some of the best friends I've gained in my whole life. And that international community definitely was and still is one of the main 
reasons why I do not regret my de decision of coming to Georgetown because I was applying to schools all over the world, basically. I was not concentrating on Qatar. Uh, but having the exposure to people from so many different nationalities was such a blessing and I learned so much through that that it's really, um, really precious to me. And I did spend a semester abroad in DC and I have to say it's very different. It's, yes, you do have exposure to international communities, but it's very, completely different feel to here. This is much, feels so much more like home. And I was thinking, would I spend my four years there? And honestly speaking, I would prefer to spend it here. Because I gained so much from that um, homey, but at the same time really rewarding um, environment of students. But at the same time, uh, academically. Um, I'm a culture and politics major which uh, we mentioned earlier is, earlier is one of the most uh, uh, ambiguous majors, like what do you teach, you know, what do you study? Uh, difficult question, definitely to answer, but let me tell you this, that this major let me explore my own interests as well as develop so many that I would not have been able to do in many other programs because I was interested in arts, I still am, however, I did not want to follow completely um, like arts direction, like artist or just English major, or I wanted a more general approach, and this major really does give me that. It shows me how politics, how power, how economics interacts all together to form the world that we have around us. And um, as, as you said, interaction with a professor, that one on one is such a blessing that many people do not think about who have not been exposed to much bigger campuses outside, which was definitely great. And uh, um, I, I don't know, it's my fourth year now, so I'm starting to reflect back on my decision of coming here, and I would definitely not regret any of it. Thank you. Well, it's... Thank you, Takla. It's, oh, it's great to know that you don't regret your decision. It's been a very rewarding experience for you. And uh, last but not least, uh, our last panelist is Mr. Talal al -Nama. Mr. Al Talal al is a graduate of Georgetown University in Qatar, class of 2015. He majored in international politics. Mr. al -Nama is a citizen of Qatar, and he's currently working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so just like uh, Jahan said, my name is Talal al -Nama. I'm from Qatar, born and bred. I went to, uh, like many of you guys in the audience here today, I went to both public and private schools in Qatar, and I graduated from the American School of Doha. Um, I'm also a graduate of Georgetown, uh, in class of 2015, where I majored in international politics. Uh, I started thinking about where to work, where to apply to in my last semester uh, here at Georgetown. Uh, three months after I graduated, uh, in August to be exact, I started working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. My transition, uh, I had to adapt to the, tr uh, to, to the new work environment at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, just like I had, just like I had, uh, just like the transition I had to make when I moved to college or I started college. Uh, also, I had to make new friends. Uh, adapt to the new work environment and also some new responsibilities. Thankfully, my colleagues at MOFA helped me with my transition as the faculty and staff here in Georgetown, uh, Georgetown helped me. Uh, many of you here uh, will be graduating in six months, so I wish you all the best. Uh, since you're all here today, you must be contemplating Georgetown. So I have three pieces of advice to you and to, uh, to everyone. Uh, but to those uh, thinking of joining Georgetown, hopefully you do. Uh, first, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, college, part of why college is uh, an important stage of your life is it's the time where you, you actually feel independent and start making your own choices. So try new things. Uh, take classes that interest you and not classes that, you know, where you can get an easy A. Uh, go study abroad in one of those uh, Georgetown programs. Te uh, Tekla uh, and I both studied at main campus and we can both guarantee, uh, we can both, uh, guarantee that uh, it's an experience you all ought to do. 
Uh, second, make new friends. Uh, the single most important thing you all should do from day one is uh, putting yourself out there and making new friends, meeting new people. Uh, many of you will be coming from outside of the country, so for the, uh, so get to know each other, get to know each other's cultures. Uh, and I guarantee you, some of the friendships that you make here will stay with you long after you graduate. Um, lastly, uh, take advantage of the, George, uh, of the opportunities offered to you here in Georgetown, from, uh, from uh, professor office hours, to the writing center, and from the health and wellness, to the, the gyms and sports facilities offered not only in Georgetown, but in QF. Uh, you really have a lot of things that you can benefit from, but go discover them. Uh, join clubs, join, uh, uh, try out for sport teams. Um, there are nine Georgetown values, but the one that resonated with me the most is educating the whole person. By the time I graduated, uh, I had learned a, a ton of new things, but uh, more importantly, I feel like I've developed spiritually, physically, and mentally. Um, I'd like to thank the, uh, Georgetown and those at the admissions office for providing me with this opportunity to talk to you, uh, speak to you. Please don't hesitate to ask any questions if, uh, and I'll be glad to answer any. Thank you. Well, um, I would like to thank our panelists for their invaluable input um, and thank you all. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a subject that I often want to run and hide from. Uh, and that is the question of the cost of attendance here at Georgetown, uh, issues of affordability, affordability uh, and talk a little bit about what, what Georgetown does and invite one of our partners from the Qatar Foundation uh, to just address this issue and, and he'll be available outside as well. Uh, but for if you are Qatari, um, you should begin to look at and to understand the rules and the policies and the systems in which you should engage with the Ministry of Education and Higher Education, and specifically the Scholarship Office, uh, what used to be called the Higher Education Institute and the Scholarship Office. There are rules, there are applications, there are deadlines, and these are all things that you should understand if you want to pursue an education at Georgetown and have these offices support you in your education. Uh, Georgetown University does make scholarships and grants available to students. Uh, from around the world that are not Qatari. Each year we try to do more and more with the limited resources that we have, uh, but we are uh, doing that for our students. Um, most of our students will receive uh, and will benefit from a package that normally contains scholarships and grants and also Qatar, Qatar Foundation, HBKU uh, financial aid. And for that, I'd like to invite Abdelaziz Al-Khanji to come and address uh, the crowd. Now, Abdelaziz and I have a very long history together. I have known him since uh, my first days in Qatar, since 2005, before he was, when he was engaged in this process on his way to university in the United Kingdom. So I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming tonight. Thank and you. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Georgetown, of course. and. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, masitu bil khair. I'm not going to take long. So, uh, as uh, John said, I'm going to talk about the financial aid, uh, which is provided by Hamad bin Khalifa University here in the Education City. Uh, we do uh, provide free of interest loan for international students who are interested uh, to apply for universities in the Education City. Uh, of course, this includes Georgetown. Uh, this free of interest loan is to be repaid after graduation, but uh, I, I mean I had to highlight that it should be repaid after graduation because I said loan in the beginning. So let's go uh, quickly through the process. After the student get admitted to, uh, to one of the universities, so I would say the prestigious universities here in the education city, they can approach us online to apply uh, for financial aid. And this financial aid as I said, a free of interest loan is given based on need. So what we do basically, or what, what the system does exactly in the, to, to provide this loan, 
we do take into consideration all financial matters and financial status of the family and take this against the tuition fees needed for the student to join the class and then whatever gap is there we have to fill this gap and this will be the loan so it's a percentage starting from zero percent to hundred percent depending on the uh, on the on the need uh, that is uh, the, the the family is um, is bearing so after graduation the student will have two uh, methods to repay this loan first one is to work in one of the approved organizations uh, by Hamad bin Khalifa University. Uh, those organizations are ministries, uh, semi-governmental uh, companies, and some private companies that have great impact on, uh, on Qatar uh, economy. In that case, the student will receive uh, as an employee, he will receive his, uh, his salary, all entitlements, we will not touch this, but the, lane, the loan will be waived, as this is considered uh, service for the country. The other option is to work for non-approved organizations uh, in or, or out of, uh, of Qatar, and in this case, the student will have to pay us 15% of the net income until the, uh, the loan is uh, settled. We do also provide scholarships for those who completed uh, two semesters as a full-time student. Um, to enter the competition, the student should get at least a 3.6 as an accumulative GBA, but we do start from four. Sometimes we, uh, we, we finalize the distribution by 3.9 or 3.8, especially in the university set in uh, like Georgetown, where all students are really smart. So you have to work really hard to get this scholarship. Well, that's all for now. I do have some uh, brochures for both financial aid and scholarships outside. And of course, you are more than welcome to, to ask me a question related to the subject, of course. Thank you very much. Shukran. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us. And I would like to invite you actually to join us outside in the lobby because members of our community will be outside. They will be, uh, they're happy to talk to you and answer any questions you might have. We actually have representatives from several offices out there. So we have representatives from the Office of Student Life, Careers, the Office of Academic Services, Academic Affairs, the Educational Enrichment Office, as well as, of course, representatives from the Financial Aid Office of uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University. Thank you.